How's it going guys? It's Stevie Dub and this is my Voyage LA interview. This is how it is. This is how it goes. I'm living the life I dreamed of living years ago. It took us some time to accomplish all our goals, but we shining right now. We have been on a fucking raw future's bright we steady shining. So let's start off with the journey. This is a lengthy piece right here. So just sit down, grab some popcorn, get some water, listen. I started off making music years back, probably 2008 is when it really started. But to really tap into the journey, what you have to understand about me is that I grew up a huge, huge, huge WWE fan, which used to be called WWE, excuse me, WWF. So I'm talking Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, The Undertaker, Triple H, all these guys. And the relevance of this in the story that I'm telling you guys right now is my on-camera persona and my personality as a hip hop artist and the way that I'm able to talk to crowds and be in front of crowds, whether that's from a performance or motivational speaking standpoint, would not be as good as it is or well-crafted as it is if it was not for the times when I was younger watching wrestling and watching guys like The Rock get on the microphone and just like dissect a crowd and just be able to you know, do certain call to actions to get, these crowd, to get the crowd reactions that they did. So it starts there. Forget about what I said about 2008, starting with music. When I was younger, I was a huge, huge, huge WWF, WWE fan. Watching these guys growing up, that literally set the foundation for who I am today as a hip hop artist. Along you know, with the fact that my mother used to listen to like you know, Aretha Franklin, Luther Vandross, Notorious B.I.G., Tupac, Snoop Dogg, all these people as I was growing up, Dr. Dre, I would listen to my mom, you know, I would listen to my mother listen to these music, listen to this music, and it was just like really enticing to me. I loved it. I loved the beats. I loved the voice. You know, the I loved the vocal performance from what I was hearing from a rap standpoint, from the R&B standpoint. And um, I was just always intrigued by music. And I was always intrigued by wrestling. Those are my two true first loves, music and wrestling. So through the years, um, I would do little things like beatbox and I would just mess around like rapping, but it was never anything that I took serious, ever. I was so, 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 so big into wrestling. When I was younger, we moved around a lot. When I was in fifth grade, we moved to three different cities. One of them that we finally decided to settle in was called Lancaster, Wisconsin. In Lancaster, Wisconsin, I met my best friend, still my best friend to this day, Ross Holman. So Ross and I grew our friendship based on wrestling. That was like the foundation of it. Um, we met. I think like Ross had like broke his arm or something and we were in a PE class together. That was kind of our initial meeting. I just knew him as the kid who had broke his arm. So he had recently just broke his arm. We, we had the same PE class together. We played a game called Big Base and Ross was running and he broke his arm and I just knew that's how I met Ross. I met Ross and knew of Ross as the guy who broke his arm. And, uh, you know, and then we became friends. Ross had a birthday party. We met at like a lot in the library or somewhere. I don't remember exactly where we met or the time that we met. I just remember that we met and we both became, we were both fans of wrestling. He's a huge WCW fan at the time. He was a huge, Sting of, a huge fan of Sting and I was a WWF guy. So he's a WCW guy, I was a WWF guy, but we are both huge, huge, huge fans of wrestling. And so that's how we grew our relationship and our friendship. I then would start going to his house. We'd start hanging out and we would record ourselves on this platform called Ustream, um, our matches just on the trampoline and we dress up as all these different characters, you name it from like Undertaker, John Cena, Edge, all these wrestlers, we would just, we would get in character and like we would just go out there and we'd play all these guys. And, and this was before YouTube even came out. We were doing live stream of, of our wrestling company, which is what it was called, SNR Wrestling, before YouTube was even popular or even a platform. Then when YouTube became a platform, we moved to YouTube and we started putting out weekly episodes of our show, SNR Wrestling, and getting other people involved in it around our community to be a part of SNR Wrestling, this huge wrestling thing that we had. We had belts that we would wear. Ross bought like tights and like all these all these different like equipment. To, and we were playing like four different characters. I was like Steve Wheezy. That was my name because I was a huge Lil Wayne fan. Uh, Primetime. I played this guy named Michael Carter, like all these other people. And so that's what it started. Like me being able to be in front of a camera, speak well in front of a camera, do a promo, like you would see The Rock and Triple H or The Rock and Stone Cold or The Rock and Vince McMahon in the ring together, doing a promo in front of 30,000, 15,000 people. That's how we started. As two kids who just loved wrestling, speaking to each other, 
pretending to be these guys and really believing that we were these guys and trying to get the emotions that they would evoke on TV over to the people who are watching us as these young little kids. So then on after, you know, we continue to do SNR wrestling seventh, eighth, ninth, you know, uh, sophomore year as well. And uh, we got everybody from the community, like I said, involved. Not everybody, but we got a decent amount of our friends and people that were just also wrestling fans willing to come out and somehow be a part of these webisodes that we would put out. Um, another cool thing that happened to us, and this is kind of where the shift happened, really, when it came down to the music aspect of everything, before I get into how I moved and got into music, <clears throat> was Ross and I are sophomore year of high school we got contacted we got contacted by uh damn what is his name i wish that ross was in here so i could ask him this um we got contacted by a guy who was a rep for this like smaller indie wrestling show and at the time joey kovar that was on the real world was like a big name he was very popular and they asked us they said we'll pay you based off watching our snr wrestling episodes on youtube We'll pay you to come down to Chicago. We lived in Wisconsin at the time. We'll pay you to come down to Chicago, record our episodes, and we'll pay for your lodging. So we're huge wrestling fans, right? So we go down there. They pay for our hotel. They pay for our food. We got to record everything. It was insane. We got to meet some of our, our you know, people that we were fans of wrestling-wise growing up. And we also got to get slammed in a wrestling ring for the first time, which, by the way, is super hard. Does not feel good at all. You may think that it's soft or wrestling's fake or whatever, but I, there's nothing fake about getting slammed in those wrestling rings. I promise you that. But the shift that, that happened at that time was we, we went down there, and when we went down there, the guys were not talking about wrestling in a very good way, and it just rubbed us the wrong way, and we were just like, damn, this sucks. We went home. After we went home, we were kind of contemplating, like, damn, are we really going to do this anymore, or what's the deal? Um, and then right around that time, my mother was married to Mitch Stasko, is his name, rest in peace. And, um, you know, I'd seen my mom go through a lot of things growing up. And, she, you know, her and my mom didn't, her and my dad didn't work out. My little brother's dad didn't work out. I'd seen my mom in other countless relationships. And um, unfortunately, Mitch passed away. My mom and him were together for about three years. <clears throat> and then four months after they got married, he passed away due to complications during a surgery. And my mom, during that time, <clears throat> my mom became uh, an alcoholic and just struggled with her mental health issues. And we butted heads a lot. And my mom and dad were separated when I was at a young age. And my mom decided that she wanted to move us to Florida. I didn't want to live in Florida. We were butting heads. We were arguing a lot. We ended up moving to Florida. So I moved away from Wisconsin where all my friends were and everybody you know that I was close with at that time, my family. And my mom and I just butted heads a lot over and over and over again. And eventually I was like, you know, fuck this. I don't want to be here no more. And so I moved to California with my dad. After I decided to make the decision to move to California, which was a tough decision, um, I didn't have any friends. I didn't know anybody. When I first moved out here, I moved to San Bernardino, which is not too far from where we're at right now. And uh, my dad lived out there. And my dad and I obviously had a great relationship. And uh, um, he welcomed me with open arms, as any father would do for their son. And I went to school at Cajon High School. It was very different. I grew up in a small, small town in Wisconsin of like 3,000 people. It's not very diverse. It's predominantly a white area. My mother's white, my dad's black. I'm half, you know, half white, half black. But where I grew up was a lot of white people that was there. And um, <clears throat> I just wasn't used to being around a lot of diverse cultures. And so when I went to school, I remember the first day that I went to school at Cajon High School, there was a big ass fight that broke out. I mean, I wasn't necessarily scared, but I wasn't like, you know, this is cool. You know, it was just weird. And like there was a lot of like gang affiliated people there. It was just a different environment for me. And, um, you know, just to pass the time, I would get on um, LimeWire and I would download music on there. Ross and I were always savvy in this, in that retrospect of, of downloading, you know, the newest, latest songs. And uh I just accidentally downloaded a beat or a couple instrumentals. <clears throat> One of them happened to be Put You on the Game by The Game. And I would listen to that instrumental walking to and from the bus stop every day before school, every day after school, over and over and over again. And then eventually I would just start like mumbling raps underneath my breath. But I never told anybody I was rapping. 
the only person that I could really tell is like my dad or Ross, but Ross, you know, my best friend, I was away from him at this time. He was still in Wisconsin. I'm in California. So I just did it on my own. I just did it on my own. And then I became friends with a couple guys. <clears throat> Shout out to Rico and Isaac. And um, these were the first guys that I introduced me as a rapper to. And they didn't freestyle at the time. They became rappers later on. But that's just how I started. I started freestyling. I didn't write a song probably for like seven months until I was into freestyling. And nobody really knew that I was rapping. And then I remember calling Ross one day. I was like, yo, <clears throat> I want to show you something. He's like, what? I was like, don't say anything. Just listen. And I remember just rapping on the phone for him for like 30 minutes. And I knew that he was still on the phone with me because I could hear him laughing at the punchlines. And uh, yeah, and then afterwards, that's just kind of how it started. Before the, before the year ended, my junior year of high school in um, California, <clears throat> a majority of the school knew who I was um, just through freestyling. Jay Kasai, shout out to him as well. Him and I became two you know, good friends my junior year, at least knew each other through freestyle rapping. Rico and Isaac became freestyle rappers at that point and we all started writing music. And um, when I first started making music though, the funny, this is a funny story. I went, I did some research. I downloaded the software Audacity, which is a recording software. You can record audio on it. And I went to, I went to a Radio Shack and I bought like a, a cheap ass, like $15 microphone. Not, not a microphone, not a microphone like this, but like just a microphone that you were just talking to, a very cheap one that's like super shitty. And my dad had speakers. He had a desk. Sorry, I'm fucking up the aesthetic here. He had a desk just like this, right? And so the keyboard would pull out of the bottom. I would have to take the speaker from right there where it's at, and I'd put the speaker right here. I put the speaker right here, and I would literally rap like this in in full with this with the, so the, imagine the speaker imagine the speaker like here literally you see how the chords are all like you can barely do it me being a dumbass i didn't think to unplug the speakers and then just rewire the chords i would just pull them just like they are recorded right there and set it down on the speaker and i'd have my head sideways like this rapping the entire song over the beat that i wrote um and that, that plays a very pivotal role in my rap career this, to this day. I, I mentioned that part, specifically that part about me doing that with the speaker and why it's so relevant now. Because if you come into the studio with me and you watch me record music, and I'm not saying this to be braggadocious, I've just seen a lot of artists get in the studio and they don't know their voice or their tone. So when they go to rap something and it doesn't sound sonically correct over the beat, and they wonder why, it's because they literally don't know their voice or they just don't have the practice. Me, starting rapping full length songs, I literally had to rap the full song because I didn't know how to cut, I didn't really know how to navigate through the, 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 uh, the software. So I would just push record, play the beat, and then I would just fucking rap the whole song, the chorus, the first verse, uh, the first verse, the chorus, the second verse, the chorus, or however it would be set up. So that was, that was an exciting time for me. Um, in my dad's office, I wrote songs like Kickback Music and uh, what were some other ones? I don't even remember the names. Kickback Music was the name of the very first song I ever wrote in my entire life. Um, maybe we can do a cut scene in that audio right now. Kickback music, kickback sound. Look fresh like a model walking down the aisle. We can kick back and just relax. Break out the soda popcorn and snack. Sit back in the chair and just recline. Sitting still as if you were at a stop sign. The light turns green, now it's time to get ghost. People love you, but they love me the most. Fast forward. Junior year, spending in California. That's how I learned, that's where I started making music and recording music. Now, during the time when I was in California, this is a very extensive story, my mother was in Florida, but she moved back to Wisconsin. I went back to go graduate with my friends. My senior year of high school, I moved back to Wisconsin. So I spent my, my junior year in California, then I moved back to Wisconsin. And um, it was just one of those things when Ross and I reconnected when I got out there, you know, it's like if your friend's doing it, you wanna do it. So of course Ross wanted to make music and it was just fun. And uh, at the time, Ross had inherited some money and he was like, yo, if we're going to do this, let's do it for real. So we went to Guitar Center and Ross dropped probably like, I don't know, a couple grand on like recording equipment, speakers, stuff for live shows. Like Ross was always like the visionary when it came to like everything that we were doing. 
and he wanted to do it big. So we just hit the ground running. We bought the equipment, we started recording on a better software, and we just recorded our first album, which is called Future in the Making, that we released in uh, November of 2008. 18 songs, and we had a show in November 8th, I think, or November 11th of 2018 or 2008 or some shit like that. Um, and that was our first show. My senior year of high school, we released four full-length projects, and we had probably about six or seven shows all over the area that we grew up in before moving to California and coming back. That's literally just the beginning of the story. Yeah,